welcome to the most casually dressed session <laughs> of the day. So you are in a startup land, and uh, in startup land, jeans are forward dress here. Uh, so as you know, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation are the drivers of economic growth in the society. And we will be covering uh, a lot of the aspects of entrepreneurship, um, the different uh, ecosystem advantages and disadvantages of uh, the ecosystem, as well as some of the policies uh, that uh, foster or prohibit uh, innovation in each uh, ecosystem. Uh, we have a very distinguished panelist uh, from very different industries. So uh, let me uh, start by asking them to give a two-minute pitch, uh, pretending that they are a room full of investors, <laughs> which actually some of you may really are. But, <laughs> so let's start with that. So Jordan. All right, well, I wasn't thinking of it as a pitch, but, uh, but here it goes. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Zehitomo.com. Zehitomo is a marketplace for local services in Japan. So local services are the jobs that happen offline, like hiring a photographer, a personal trainer, a plumber. Um, it's wild that in this day and age you can buy almost anything online, but you can't order your wedding photographer, you can't renovate your kitchen. So these services, it's a, an industry that's as large as food, considered around $200 billion in Japan, yet the online penetration is around 2.5%. So you ask yourself, why is it so offline? And it's an incredibly inefficient, non-transparent market because you have very custom needs. When you're looking for your wedding photographer or looking to renovate your kitchen, it's not just an A set or a B set. You have a custom set of needs, uh, and professionals will give you a custom uh, set of solutions, kind of tailor-made. So matching custom with custom is a bit closer to recruiting or dating than it is to e-commerce. Uh, and we are set on, uh, on solving it such that it becomes uh, as easy to hire that plumber or photographer as it is to order something online. And at the same time, uh, in Japan, there's a big movement right now, Hatarakiata Kaikaku, to change the way people work in Japan. Uh, so we really um, empower freelancers and small businesses uh, to grow uh, by using our platform as a lead generation source um, so that they can be good at what they're good at. Uh, and I think in Japan there's so many really talented professionals and artisans all across the country. And so we really want to empower that uh, while making a more productive Japan so that it's easier to hire them. My name is Jose Fernandez. I'm COO and co-founder of Biointeractive Technologies. For people who have suffered stroke or who have carpal tunnel syndrome or any type of tendinitis, we're creating a solution that is a wearable band that you use, you use at your wrist with a mobile app and a cloud system that monitors muscle and tendon movement at the wrist and is currently monitoring your hand of overuse and also helping with rehab exercises. This is in US alone costing the US healthcare system $20 billion but also in loss of productivity $100 billion annually. So we're solving that issue. Hi, my name is Christopher X, and I'm in the beer industry, so very different. Um, I um, am CEO and uh, founder of a German beer restaurant chain here in Tokyo. We have 10 restaurants and are expanding to 30 shops by the end of next year. We brew our own beer, which we're now moving into retail. I have a background in venture capital. I was running, um, I was uh, in a management position in a VC fund focused on e-commerce and fintech in New York and before that Mexico and decided to then go full offline into one of the most traditional retail sectors, restaurants, um, because I thought it was interesting because there was less competition and I had a new way of thinking. We started with a food truck driving around the streets of Tokyo five, four and a half years ago and had our first shop open three years ago. We have since grown to the 10. We've raised that we've grown the team to 250 people. We've raised about 20 million USD in growth capital and are now expanding both here and internationally. Okay, thanks. And, and my name is Emre and um, I'm with the Globus Capital Partners, which is a, a VC division of Globus. And we invest mostly into Japanese startups, uh, IT startups, uh, at usually their Series A and onwards. Um, so we have very, uh, you know, diverse background of entrepreneurs uh, tackling very different industries. It's almost very hard to find the commonalities between <laughs> the, the three. But I think um, I want to start by asking uh, Jordan and, and Christopher, um, you know, given your background and expertise, you could have started business in a, anywhere in the world. And, and, and I want to ask by asking why Japan? Was it a deliberate choice? And what was the reasoning behind that? 
Uh, sure, so I'll start. Um, so I've lived and worked in Japan for the last 10 years. Um, my background, I'm an engineer, um, and then I ended up working in finance for eight years before starting Zeichitomo. So the reason I started in, uh, in Japan as opposed to going back to California, which is where many of my colleagues uh, you know, work on their businesses or in the IT space, uh, is simply because uh, I'm here and there's a huge opportunity here. And being an engineer, I'm very lazy. I want to live in an environment where things are very nice and pleasant. Uh, and I've worked very, very hard to try to automate that and make that. And I'd say that while working in finance, things were very efficient, right? The markets open and close on time. The trains come and leave on time. The, the sushi tastes great every single day. Uh, and it was a very wonderful lifestyle. But outside of those constructs, um, you know, getting married, uh, moving, buying a place, having kids, uh, the services industry was just incredibly inefficient. Um, and there's, it's incredibly painful to try to find and hire the right person for your job. And it's very hard from I found from many um, my friends and colleagues in the space uh, to work as a freelancer or as a small business uh, to grow. And it just seemed like a huge business opportunity and at the same time there was a huge uh, socioeconomical implications of doing what we're doing. Every day there's people that have dozens of things on their to-do list and even if they have the budget to get it done, it's not getting done because it's a huge project to find the right person, to hire them, to make it happen. And so I think we can actually, if we do a great job, we can really contribute to Japan's uh, GDP uh, by having more GMB as a platform, by making it easier and easier, enabling both sides of the platform uh, to connect more easily. And I think there are people doing similar things across the world, uh, but in Japan there are very few internet players. Um, and. Uh, you know, as a result, there is less competition in, in all those factors as well. But I just think the opportunity here um, is, is tremendous, and it's a shame that no one else is doing it, so that's why I started here. Okay. Yeah, Christopher? I, um, I came in for the opportunity. I decided to, I first actually decided to go into, into retail and within retail into restaurants, and then thought that as a German, there was a huge opportunity to build a modern German concept here because. Japanese love beer. Germany makes <laughs> great beer. Uh, German beer is uh, prohibitively expensive. It, uh, it retails at about $12 because it's imported. It's also not fresh by the time it gets here. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And as a, generally, as a young German, I thought that we haven't really done a great job at exporting our culture, or especially our restaurant culture. I think it's one of the considered one of the worst, which is absolutely not true. Um, so I thought the opportunity was interesting. Japan is the, one of the largest restaurant industries in the world, driven by you know, Japanese eating and dining, uh, dining and drinking with their colleagues as well as with their friends constantly. Um, so that was the first kind of decision-making process. I also thought I've lived in, I'd lived in Japan before, I'd lived in China before. I thought Japan was a great trampoline as a consumer brand to start out in. I think Japan is still considered globally as a leader in taste and in, in experiences. So I thought that starting here would give us a great initial platform to then launch into next Asian markets. I see. So, so both of you are drawn by the, the opportunities and, and lack of solution, I guess, uh, in the market. Um, but you know, Japan is not known globally for the startup ecosystem yet. Um, how is it like to start a business here? How did you view the ecosystem? Was it helpful or not? Or your real, st real life stories, if you could share? Uh, sure, so I think it's very different from you know, Silicon Valley or New York. Uh, and again, I've, so we've raised around five and a half million, uh, almost all from investors based in Japan. Um, a few based in Silicon Valley, so I think you know, maybe Jose or Klaus can comment more on that. Um, but the, the field is much less educated than it is overseas. And so if I'm giving a pitch to traditional Japanese investors for one hour, 55 minutes of it may be explaining what is local services, why don't we take a margin in between, why is it a lead generation platform? Uh, and it's kind of like peeling onions. Uh, whereas there are, um, there are obviously very sophisticated investors like Lobus, like many of the kind of international funds that have uh, a physical location in, in Japan. And so I think it's definitely an improving landscape, but the startup ecosystem in Japan is really in its infancy. And Compared to 10, 15 years ago when I was in California, and you could start to feel that excitement around startups, all my colleagues graduating and going off to you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon, uh, I think you're starting to feel that here. It's not going to happen. There's parallels. It's not going to happen at the same scale. But the momentum and directionality, I feel, is, is very good. Talking to new grads now versus new grads in Japan 10 years ago. Um, but it, yeah, it's, a, I think, a slow and steady uh, good directionality. I, see. I mean, as, as a non-native non non Japanese, um, 
did you feel like advantage or disadvantage starting a business here? Uh, both. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's definitely the novelty factor, right, uh, which can maybe get you in the door the first time or get an introduction to somebody that you might not have had an introduction to otherwise. Uh, I think the best advantage is just the, the cultural elements that you can bring to the game uh, that, you know, maybe in Japanese traditionally might be more risk averse, right, or might take, you know, a, a more kind of due diligence process uh, or, or an approach to kind of working with a different vendor. And so we have to see, we have to just be aware of what our strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. And for some relationships, it's important that we have a senior Japanese uh, member that's able to kind of work with, uh, with, with our counterparts and develop and nurture that relationship. Whereas in other cases, we can be a bit more guiding uh, and, and try to do things fast. Chris, for your experience? Uh, for my experience, well, my experience has, to be honest, been overwhelmingly positive. I came here with total investment capital of $20,000. I lived on an air mattress on an attic, and I drove around town with a food truck, and I didn't speak a word of Japanese. <laughs> um, and the reception of people was one of of excitement, one of curiosity, one of willingness to help, uh, which I, I personally did not expect. Um, so, yeah, very positive. I've never raised capital here. I've only raised capital abroad, so I cannot speak uh, about that. Um, I very much agree with you on the, the upsides and downsides of, of building a business here. I think that um, there's tremendous upsides in building a business in Japan where the risk level, just because people are so trustworthy and and, and um, such uh, are much higher than other countries, which I think decreases or deflates risk for an entrepreneur. Um, I think that being a foreigner here in many ways is an opportunity because, as you said, um, sometimes you can follow and do the things in the right way, and sometimes you just kind of rashly move forward and get forgiveness as a result. So, personally, from uh, uh, my experience, it's been yeah, incredible. Okay, so, Jose, you, you live in the the innovation capital of the world, Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Um, how is it there, especially after seeing you know Japan and you lived in different places in the world? So in, in my case, it was the different experience like you guys. So I was living here in, in Tokyo, and I was a global lead for a semiconductor company for healthcare business development. And um, healthcare, it's a quite complicated industry. It takes a lot of time to develop a product that you can sell. So it takes iterations, it takes a lot of um, clinical trials, and people are not really interested in investing in those phases. Um, we need a lot of angel investors and people who are familiar with the industry to take risks. And uh, the profile of the Japanese investor is not there yet. So in our case, we, I, I decided to move to San Francisco and uh, the reality shocked me. It's like I found a lot of mentors and I found a lot of people that were doing the same thing that I was doing. And the amount of support that I received from the community, it's amazing. However, it's so competitive that there's so much noise that you have to have a really compelling product or a really solid team. And in our case, um, our company is based in Vancouver. My two co-founders are from Canada. I'm Mexican, so I moved just in time for the presidential election of Donald Trump, <laughs> uh, which was hard, uh, being Mexican and trying to run a business in California. It, it was hard. Um, but again, like the support that we received from the Canadian government and uh, from Mexico as well to start our business in Silicon Valley was overwhelming. Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting from Silicon Valley is that you have access to the network. People who have done it before you, who have succeeded, and people who have failed. And you learn from that. And people are willing to share that with you. Uh, on the other hand, you have access to the capital. So there's a lot of angel investors. The decision makers are there. So in our case, being a wearable platform, we have to be integrated or we have, I mean, we have a route into different markets. One of them could be consumer virtual reality. We can control things as well. So our passion is in healthcare though. But if we wanted to go into the consumer space, you have the Googles and the Apples and all those companies there that you can pretty much have the decision makers there. Um, so I, I think those were the key 
point for us in starting the business there. Um, obviously, raising capital for us has been easier in, in the US as well. And uh, just want to think the profile, like we can raise money in different instruments. So for example, in our case, raising to safes was really easy in, in San Francisco, whereas in other parts of the world, even in Canada, uh, people are not familiar with the safe. So they want to raise some convertible notes, so it becomes a little bit more complicated for a startup to, to access that, that kind of capital. So, so safe is like a standard uh, contract, so that you know, startups and VCs don't need to negotiate one by one. And how was the fundraising experience for Jordan in Japan? Yeah, so I'd say it's never easy. Um, I would say that there, as I alluded to earlier, there are like, very different types of VCs and investors, uh, institutional funds, um, angels uh, across Japan. Um, we did a couple of rounds. We did our announced our seed last year and our Series A earlier this year. And I think we're very happy to have amazing investors. I think that have the balance of kind of Silicon Valley style while being based in Japan. But we definitely did speak with many, uh, you know, many Japanese investors here uh, with very large funds. Uh, and the, you know, the, the ongoing joke is that there's more money than good ideas in Japan. So I think it is a very, you know, uh, a very good place to, to raise um, if you do have something that's a good fit for the Japanese market. Uh, but the, the main reason for us is that our product was for Japanese consumers and Japanese users, and that's why it made sense that we had a network of Japanese investors. Mm. Um, yeah. You have a point? Um, yeah, what I, I think what's interesting, from my experience, I, I didn't raise here, not because I was against it, but because I have a venture capital background in Europe and the US, so it made more sense. I had an existing network. But I found overwhelming interest in investing into Japan, actually. Um, I thought that I think a lot of people are underexposed but excited about the market. So I think in many ways the fact that we were in Japan made it easier for us to fundraise because people were looking for opportunity here and it's difficult to ac have access to deal flow here, especially from abroad. Yes, actually as a VC, uh, some of our L uh, LPs, the investors, are non-Japanese, uh, but they have a very increasingly uh, appetite for Japanese uh, VC and startup uh, investment opportunities. And just to give you a perspective, uh, last year I think $3 billion US dollars was uh, invested into Japanese startups, which is uh, still not at the level of US, which was I think $80 billion or China, similar. But that $3 billion is a 50% increase from the year before. And ev almost every year that figure is uh, growing by 50 to 70%. So the Japanese startup ecosystem is still, you know, uh, at the early stage, but it's growing quite fast. And I want to ask entrepreneurs, so you have, if you have two options, you know, starting in Silicon Valley or China, where the resources and networks and experience are abundant, but also the competition is super fierce, or uh, Japan or other ecosystem where the resource is not at the level yet, but the opportunity is abundant and the competition is not super fierce, which one would you prefer? Uh, I guess I'd prefer to arbitrage that scenario. <laughs> I'd, uh, I mean, I definitely like the, the hustle that, that you see in, in China or when I go back to New York, and I think there isn't enough of that hustle and that, that energy and that vibe here. Uh, and it has to do with the risk taking, it has to do with, with all the kind of relevant components. But, uh, you know, I think starting a, a startup in Japan is one of the best places to do so. I think it's only going to get better and better. I think it's a great balance right now between funds available and the lack of competition. I think there's only going to be more and more competition. There's only going to be more and more funds invested, uh, as you're mentioning, 50% of year on year. And so I would try to take the, the know-how and the hustle from overseas uh, and, and the talent where possible uh, and, and run with it here in Tokyo. Okay. Other takes? In our case, uh, it, because we are a highly regulated industry, we have to go to FDA certification first. So it didn't make sense for us to start in Japan. It's easier to go for the US or the European market first, get your approvals, and then customize for specific markets. So I think it depends on the product, it depends on the, on the industry that you're playing. Uh, in our case, it didn't necessarily make sense to be here in Japan. But we want to be in Japan in the future. Um, for my experience, the fund I worked for and what I do now has always been opportunity driven. So I would argue that infrastructure for funding, etc., is nice, but we do live in, in a global world where you can have access to these things even if you're based here, meaning I would put opportunity first and I would argue that the opportunity here, because of the lack of, um, of 
hungry entrepreneurs is bigger. So, so just for a moment, pretend that you're not entrepreneurs, you are instead the policy makers. Uh, what do you want to change? What, what policies do you want to change uh, in order to foster more innovation and entrepreneurship in Japan or any other ecosystem? So, sorry again. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things, right? I, I remember talking to some legal friends who have been tracking the space in Japan and, and kind of labor laws and laws around HR. And he was telling me that the good news is that, or the bad news is that we're 30 years behind the US. Uh, the good news is that we're consistently 30 years behind, and so we will catch up. It's just a matter of time. Arbitrage. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so I think, you know, sooner or later, I'm optimistic that Japan will get there. But yeah, as a startup, it would be, you know, it would be nicer if it was easier to fire people, right? We have to start people on three-month contracts because, you know, we're not sure if we hire somebody and then they get sick and then, you know, we're, what do we do, right? And as a startup that needs to move fast, just those components that let us move fast, uh, I would also say that just from a fundraising or from a you know, running a company perspective, um, in Japan, like, I think historically, one reason that many people didn't want to have companies is that you're personally liable, right? And so if you borrow money from the bank or if you do other things, uh, you have these personal liabilities. And I think that makes it much harder to uh, fail and learn. <laughs> and so you really have to have a lot of conviction or you really have to have people behind you um, that are going to give you that capital and not have to worry about um, it, you know, putting you out on the streets. Uh, but those are just a couple to name. I would also I think just things in the educational system, right? We'd definitely like to hire more, you know, engineers that are based in Japan. There's clearly a, a demand supply problem there. Uh, we definitely like to have more women in the workforce, um, and so I would definitely echo some of the suggestions that were made by some of the earlier panelists this morning um, around forcing companies to show their their you know wage gaps, right? To um, you know to a handful of other different uh, issues that surround uh, women in the workforce. But we're very much uh, supporting the freelance economy. And as a result, we just want to make it easier for people to enter that. And so we think that you know, women or other people, we just want to make it as easy as possible for them um, to grow their business and to, to do what they're amazing at and to be able to make money from that. So I think ultimately that direction will continue to grow. Okay. I'll share one of, ex of my experience coming to Japan when I first came here. Um, I was going to move uh, to a company. And one week before moving to Japan, they told us that my spouse visa was denied because Japan didn't recognize my marriage. And my spouse, it's a, it's a guy, so uh, we couldn't move. So I think there's still other things rather than just building women into the labor force. Um, I mean, people in Silicon Valley, you get the same equal rights as any other person. In Japan, it's still lagging in that as well. So I'm assuming that there's a lot of people that can come here and might be interested in even working here and because of things like that um, you're not interested in moving. Um, I think women in workforce it's a global problem um, especially in STEM uh, careers. Um, our team it's we only have one woman in the team and it's been really hard to recruit women engineers and We've looked in Silicon Valley, we looked in Canada, we looked in, we, we've looked in, we've locked uh, probably just two people who are interested in working with us. And uh, it's kind of hard because our pathologies, like the stroke and carpal tunnel, it's a woman disease. And we lack that kind of understanding. So I, I don't think that's necessarily true specifically to Japan. I think it's a global problem, specifically in technology companies. Um, Language, it's, it's another problem. Um, I, I think I speak fairly good Japanese, but it was really hard to move to Japan. Um, daily activities, building your... People that don't speak Japanese struggle. Um, when I was trying to do sales meetings here in Japan, um, even though I spoke Japanese, there was a lot of nuance around the etiquette that I didn't necessarily understand. So... Um, even my ex-manager was like not helping with me to, to help in that as well. So um, it's not necessarily policy related, but I think it's more like uh, the cultural part. For me personally, the high beer tax is a big problem. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, what we discussed it briefly earlier. Um, there are several uh, bureaucratic um, 
thresholds which are relatively difficult when you when you're trying to grow a, a growth financed um, business um, it's very difficult to detach economic ownership from 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 voting rights which is very much at the core of how you know a venture financed business should work which is that you can seize some of the economic opportunity in exchange for being able to grow faster but get to ideally keep control over the business while you steer it um, so those things I've spent a lot of money with lawyers trying to find solutions to and it's very difficult um, but my I think the biggest one is, is culturally and I'm probably echoing a lot of people who said it before but if the same willingness to fail that has become the status quo in you know the entrepreneurial com communities in the US and more and more so in Europe would become more accepted here I think that would really be a game changer I think there's a lot of talent here I think people's minds have worked very fast a lot of people who have great ideas, it's just the unwillingness to take risk um, that I've seen with, with team members, with people I know, with potentially great entrepreneurs who are just not ready to make that step, not only because of the economic risks, but also because of the cultural unacceptance of doing that, because it's not something that people aspire to be, it's not something people admire, it's something that's still looked at with a lot of prejudice and with a lot of concern, taking the entrepreneurial uh, leap. So, so talents, so you all speak of uh, talents, and talents are the, the most fundamental like, resources that uh, is necessary for the growth of the startups. Um, I hear like, like you know, in the Silicon Valley, there are a lot of engineers, but they are super expensive and super competitive. So it's hard to retain uh, our engineer uh, who get poached by uh, big uh, you know, Google, uh, Amazon of the world for twice the uh, compensation. <laughs> Uh, whereas in Japan, um, I think that the cost of the engineers is not that high yet, but still uh, there's like um, not enough engineers. That's what I'm hearing. Is that is that what uh, what you experience in respective ecosystems? Oh yeah, like um, for the salary of one engineer in Silicon Valley, you can pay five engineers in Vancouver. That, that's kind <laughs> of the same skill set. And on top of that, a, there's a rotation. The, Every two, three years, people just want to move to the next, um, to the next company, so they build their resume. Um, also, the what these companies offer, it's ridiculous. Like um, my friends that work at Google or Apple, is like, well, if you don't drive me to my office and you don't give me like food from uh, X, Y, or Z restaurant, then I won't work there. Um, if people just ring their dirty clothes and they leave it in the front of the reception and they actually wash their clothes. So it, it's ridiculous. Like, like these companies offer so many things for, for engineers that uh, it's really hard to compete with them. So in our case, we are incubating our center. All of our engineers are in Vancouver. When we grow, we might be able to move to Silicon Valley, but not now. Jordan, how's your experience? Yeah, it's, it definitely is a demand and supply problem in Japan. The salaries and the wages overall in Japan are nowhere near Silicon Valley, right? I think the there are some other sessions that we're talking about why wages don't rise, and um, you, you know, I think there there are a lot of really talented people here. Uh, I think the mindset is definitely shifting towards accepting uh, people that go to smaller companies, right? Ten years ago, if you were a very good student, you would graduate and you would go to the biggest company possible, right? If you were so-so, you would go to a a smaller company, and if you're an utter failure, you would become an entrepreneur or a freelancer. And I think that that concept and that um, approach is, is definitely shifting, uh, but not fast enough. And I think the government can do more to uh, kind of have those going back to the policy question uh, to you know allow that that talent to kind of uh, rotate. Maybe not as free as Silicon Valley, and, and we don't really want you know a culture of entitlement to come upon us, but. Yeah, if Sharp has a lot of engineers and they're struggling, mm -hmm. instead of making it harder for other companies to compete with them by subsidizing their business, uh, let it fail and flood the market with talent, right? I think that would be great because there's, I think, so, much, so many things that we can do um, if, if we have the talent. Okay. I want, I want to shift gears and move on to the, the global like, you know, competition and strategy for you. Um, I think all of you are uh, in, in currently one market right, right now, but we, you have uh, global ambitions. Um, when is the right timing to go global? Is it after conquering you know, one market and then move to the next, or is it go you know, simultaneous? What's your thoughts on that? I can start. Um, I thought about this question before. Yeah. Um, my previous uh, 
company Rocket Internet essentially did um, everything at once. So we uh, expanded e-commerce e uh, companies into 80 markets simultaneously and we grew them really fast. We grew from inception 2007 uh, to 27,000 people in the first six years of the business. Um, took over a lot of market share in many countries, but then um, started struggling uh, because uh, in, this, in this simultaneous rapid growth through many markets with excess capital, we didn't actually manage to build uh, cultures, um, very strong cultures. So we had a huge talent uh, drain very shortly after because everyone was excited about the growth, but then we actually we started becoming slower growing companies and the excitement disappeared. Um, and I think culture is, is at the core of almost every business. I'm now on the, on the consumer facing side. I'm a consumer brand selling an experience. So for me, culture is even more important than if I was, for example, um, an industrial. Um, so I think just purely from my perspective, um, when building a consumer brand, I, th I, I would argue that it's better to build a really strong brand in your home market, really understand what your core is, um, be able to communicate that, build a strong DNA, and then having leveraging that expanding, I would argue, might be the better path. In our case, we, we're taking advantage of NAFTA, now US MCA. Um, it's, it's impossible for, for us to do clinical trials in in US. It's super expensive. So we do we run clinical trials in Canada, in Mexico, um, which is one tenth of the price that we will have to pay in, in US. Also, there's a regulation part. So we're focusing on a North American market first. Uh, we learn from, from the cycles of R&D clinical trials, and then when we set up on the features that we need for our final product, we go to FDA certification and then we go global. Uh, otherwise, if you go to FDA certification, and there's a few companies in the market right now that went to FDA certification, they were rejected, um, and they have to go to another cycle. So an amount of money that is sunk into the hardware companies like ours in which we have a proprietary sensor around the wrist, it's enormous. It, it's, you, you, if you fail, you're losing your shareholders' money as well. So um, our strategy, and, and maybe that's because we have NAFTA, USMCA, I don't know, but we only got one letter um, instead of two, but anyway. Um, it gives a lot of advantages. Like in Japan, um, I'm not particularly aware that there's any type of collaboration between um, countries who are close, Korea, China, but maybe something that could benefit from interchange of talent between these regions will be interesting. Um, so in our case, we develop the electronic circuits in Mexico, we manufacture in China, we actually assembly in Canada. So even though we're not global, we are pretty much uh, everywhere. I'm just curious, were you affected by the Trump's administrations pulling out from NAFTA? And yes, um, there was a special type of visa called a TN that was under the NAFTA agreement and it's harder to get those kind of visas. So for my co-founders, being Canadian, um, to come and work in the States, it's, it's hard. So in my case, being the only one who has a permanent resident in the US, I'm supposed to be doing everything my, myself and bringing them is hard. So, um, yeah, those type of special visas, the TNs, um, were really helpful. Also to bring talent from, from other regions as well, mm -hmm. Mexico and Canada. Mm -hmm. I would just say that it's a, it's a matter of priorities and I think it really depends on the type of company, right? If you're a consumer faced, um, you know, company, in, in our case, if we're dealing with local services, there's very few synergies between hiring a plumber in Tokyo and hiring a plumber in Paris. Uh, there's the know-how, um, but there's other very you know, localized uh, businesses in all these other different countries doing different things. So I think in, in our specific example, uh, when we go overseas, it would probably be uh, as M&A, uh, because it takes time to build up that marketplace on both sides, the supply and demand, uh, and it is pretty intricate in terms of the user experience. Uh, but then there's uh, other examples where if you already have clear product market fit and you don't go global and someone else does it before you, then you may miss your opportunity. So in, in local service, we are very focused on Japan, given that uh, nowhere globally has anybody, uh, any online player been able to solve, to even take 1% market share uh, in, in local service. This is very much an offline game. And I think Japan being $200 billion in local services, if we're able to crack that and solve that, uh, whichever country is able to do that, 
uh, first in a more meaningful way is going to probably M and A uh, their their way to the top. So it's a matter of I think timing and, and optics. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the the story you mentioned before? The, um, not on this panel, but um, you mentioned that you have a, like a network of entrepreneurs that, are, that have similar models in different countries that are communicating together and working together sometimes? Uh, yes, actually. Yes. So uh, just last weekend uh, we were in Amsterdam together and it's again a very common problem that uh, there's billion dollar companies in the US right, or in, in other countries uh, that still you know haven't fully solved this right it is you know and, and to an extent that's why we do welcome competition right we're we're trying to bring this offline market online and in Japan particularly many of the, the vendors on our platform are still using fax machines right or sending their you know magnets in, in the mail uh, to say you know when you need something come to us and so you know how can we educate a you know a, a very large market how, what can we do to kind of really 10x the user experience uh, and I, I mean the refreshing thing is that when you go there, every other country has their own, you know, very, very similar problems. Uh, and, but due to the optics of their country, they're able to take slightly different approaches and, and have different learnings. So I think we definitely are all, you know, set on sharing this. Uh, and maybe we will be buying each other out in five to ten years. Uh, there definitely are players doing that. Uh, uh, there, there is some consolidation already. But, uh, yeah, it's very much a, a, a very large problem to solve, and that's what motivates me and my team. Uh, is that it's it's not solved, mm. uh, and this is a huge opportunity. And solving it will provide so much value um, to the the country as well as as a business. I think that model is really interesting. Like you know, so so you you exchange ideas and expertise on a global level uh, between entrepreneurs that's tackling the individual local markets, and and together you're solving the the, you know, the yeah. problem. Do, did, in your rocket internet days, uh, did you see that you know model like you know, happening, and was it working? Well, Rocket is, I think, primarily known as a really fierce competitor and a very aggressive company. Yeah. So we definitely were not friends with our, our outside competition. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. Uh, but what we did, of course, and what was the very idea, we had two primary ideas. First, we saw a big opportunity for e-commerce in developing markets, hoping that technology would leapfrog and basically, you know, consumers would skip directly from mom and pop to e-commerce rather than going through the the development that we went through in in, um, in most developed countries, which is mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. then uh, department stores, then you know, uh, one category retailers, and then slowly e-commerce, uh, which has happened successfully in China. Um, so we were very much hoping that we could build all these businesses simultaneously. Leap consumer uh, purchasing would leapfrog to e-commerce, and we could be the global platform and share all of our experience. And that sounded really nice. Um, but in reality, I think when you have markets which are so fundamentally different and also mentalities among the people that you hire which are so different, we learned that both when it comes to, let's say, marketing, but also when it comes to the, the back end, to infrastructure, to people, we had to, you know, there was some best practice to draw from and we centralized on, on our design team who designed the colors of our marketing banners in Berlin. But ultimately, every market was very specific and hence it wasn't able, we weren't able to create as much synergy as we showed our investors we would in the deck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so before moving uh, on to the Q&A, I want to ask one last question. So, you know, nowadays we say that data is the new oil, and instead of the uh, seven, you know, old seven sisters, we have the new seven sisters, which is, uh, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Um, and some, some people say that you know, those big tech players are actually uh, restricting the competition uh, and actually uh, not prohibiting the startup to grow, uh, to you know, compete uh, against them. Um, what's, your, what's your take on that? Are they, what, you know, what are their roles in the innovative uh, landscape? So, so I have a lot of experience with these guys. Yeah. Um, Good and bad experiences. Uh, Apple just recently announced that they were going to launch in their Apple Watch Series 4, the ECG. The medical community was shocked. Because how can, to, to get to a point in which you make a wearable device, FDA, FDA approved, you need a lot of clinical data. So, and I particularly was working before creating my company in, in the same thing that these guys were working. And, um, the only reason that I have is that these guys are either lobbying in Washington or there's a route for them to go to a 510k 
which is a, um, for people who are not familiar with the medical regulation environment, it's a, you can either go for a pre-market approval or a 510K, which means that there's a similar product in the market that you can, have, has the same predicate as yours, so you can regulate against that device. But they were announcing that this is the first device in the industry to do that. So Apple comes out of the southern, brings this to the market, and all the other companies who were actually investing eight, nine years of product development were suddenly killed. Um, and uh, we have also been kind of, because we're at the wrist, uh, we're competing with Apple Watch. Mm. So the only way for us to be competitive with them is to differentiate our product because it's a consumer market. Uh, ours, it's a medical device. So you already had a stroke, you already had carpal tunnel. So you have the need to change or take out your Apple Watch and then use our wearable device. So there's a need in the market. Whereas in the ECG, you're preventing something from happening in the first place. So you're preventing an arrhythmia or you're preventing a heart arrest. So people don't feel the need that they need to be monitoring 24 seven. So you either go for a niche market and totally differentiate from these guys, or you always have the risk to be overwhelmed or taken over by these companies. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they have these, all these secret product teams that it's impossible to know what, the, what they're working on. So. Um, to speak a little, I mean, my most relevant experience would probably be from e-commerce, because what we did was we built Amazon competitors. Um, we thought that Amazon was, well, not we thought, Amazon was so busy focusing on, on developed nations that they hadn't actually, even in 2012, they hadn't even launched in Italy yet because they, were, they didn't think it was a market worth going into when they hadn't taken full advantage of the economic opportunities in other markets. And we then tried to fill that gap. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, um, I mean, Amazon for us was, was a big threat. We ended up exiting the e-commerce portfolio in, in Asia, Lazada to, to Alibaba. Um, and it's a big threat, and I think data is, is, is at the core of it. Because if you think about it, all these places are not, I mean, Amazon is not from the way we thought, saw it, it's, it's not a retailer. It's like the, re, the high street, right? It's the place where retailers go. And if you own a majority of the high street and you control uh, who gets to be on there, and you also have all the data from all the people that go shopping on that street, um, then obviously you have much better marketing opportunities than if you have a tiny side street somewhere, um, which means that I think e-commerce, and that's what's been happening, will be consolidated, and that creates, you know, very scary, um, very large corporations. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would just add that I think that's why Japan is such a great place to build a tech company right now. <laughs> I think when you look at, and, and we do see that, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, all these players are getting involved in local services. And we see that, you know, they are, you know, trying out different things. None of them have really kicked off, but they all recognize that this is a very large untapped consumer sector that they want to be involved with. Um, that said, we expect that they are going to succeed to some extent in the U.S. before they take those efforts global, um, as they keep on trying things or not. And so we can see a little bit into the future by being overseas, but I think also in Japan we have a real opportunity to build a consumer brand. Uh, and just like Amazon became its own brand, um, or Tencent or Alibaba or all these other com uh, companies, I think in Japan, uh, Japan, Japanese generally, and I try to generalize, uh, but do like brands. And I think if we're able to do that and, and have a place in the consumer's minds, then uh, hopefully we or others can become you know, the, the next Amazons, uh, but out of Japan. Okay. So, so with that, we would like to move on to the Q&A. Uh, we'd like to take questions in batches, maybe two or three. So you, yes. Uh, my question is that based on your experience, based on your experience, uh, what kind of businesses or industries are suitable for launching startup in from Tokyo? And I'm not uh, considering the fact that uh, there are so many industries. Uh, considering the, 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 the culture and, and uh, politics and uh, such kind of economy. That's my question. Okay. Thanks. And we had a question here. Hi, um, I have a question about the, uh, this acceptance for failure, and we hear this all the time. And but it's cultural issues. Uh, you can't change people overnight. It takes forever. So, is it actually should be rephrased as like an entrepreneur having a thick skin? 
as opposed to assuming people around them to really change. So, okay. We can take maybe one more question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, your businesses are all centered in Tokyo, right? But there are other regional cities in Japan. For example, Fukuoka had some of the high, highest number of startup last year. In Kagawa, just uh, rated highest rate of startup. So, do you see opportunities in other cities? And if so, which and why? If not, why? Okay, so we had two quick, quick questions. Uh, one is uh, what businesses is suitable to start in Tokyo. The second one is acceptance for failure, and then the opportunities in regional cities. Whichever you want to take. Yes. Can I answer the second one? Sure. Okay. Um, I think it's an excellent question. I think you're absolutely right. It's not something that you can, you can't just switch on overnight. Your level of you know risk aversity or or willingness uh, to take risk. Um, but Germany, I think, is a relatively good example that a cultural shift among young people doesn't take two generations. Um, we Germans are traditionally quite risk averse, and then we saw a huge growth in, in, in startups and people becoming entrepreneurs over the last 10 years. When I went to university, everyone was going, and we were all planning to go into investment banking, or well, finance consulting, basically, some people into commodities. And then we saw the economic opportunity coming out of the Silicon Valley. And at some point, just I saw a massive shift in my entire peer group, where at least 60 to 70 percent of my friends now work actually in the in the startup sphere. When it was less than 10 percent of, let's say, the equivalent of my peer group that is 10 years older than me, um, because there was, I would argue, a shift away from you know the traditional um, view of the entrepreneurs someone can, a little bit crazy and you know taking that taking that jump and hoping that it works towards a very kind of rational approach where the economic opportunity that comes with building a business and financing fast growth became better than the salary in a, in a bank right and that's when you know and then at the same time you have the realization that there's not actually that much risk right if you fail with a company of course you've taken reputational risk and you know in an ideal case you haven't burned any investor money yet but even those people who've invested with you, in, you know, they should understand the risk profile you're investing, they're investing into, and you should be sure to, ven to mention that, you know, as a young company, there's a risk of failure. You cannot, you cannot guarantee returns. Um, so ultimately, there's not that much that can go wrong. Right? You might fail, but then, you know, if you have a good track record, you'll be employed right away, or you can just start another venture right away. And I think at some point it clicked in Germany, and that some point happened within the last 10 years. So I would argue it's possible. A massive PR campaign of some sort. Sorry? It's certainly a massive PR campaign of some sort for the young people. Is that what it is? That happened um, too. The German government happily, uh, heavily started promoting startups, but um, I think it was driven by driven by e-commerce success stories that came out of Germany, which no one thought was possible. Um, a lot of I mean, billions of euros in, 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 in shareholder value were created um, from Berlin, and then everyone realized how much money everyone else was making and went after it. Also, another thing, like, for example, I'm, I did my MBA here at Lobis, and the education that you receive is tailored to be an entrepreneur. So for me, Globis was kind of a mind-shifting part of my education. I'm a medical doctor, I'm a surgeon, and I'm an electrical engineer. And I was really frustrated because I couldn't bring a product to the market. So when I was here in Japan, Globis helped me to change my mindset. It's not, it's not just a Japanese thing. It's like we, I think humans tend to do the less effort for the best benefit. Um, I think education, like universities like Globis are changing that. Role models, like having an IPO, a successful IPO, and seeing people who have succeeded before you, it's super important for young entrepreneurs so that they can reflect themselves into that. And uh, just uh, on your question, in healthcare, I'm really surprised because like Tokyo is, you have a lot of medical companies here, but also in Matsuyama or Kyoto, you have one of the largest companies, um, um, I, I would say, in, in healthcare globally, uh, Omra. So there's, across, Japan, there's a lot of good medical companies that are really distributed in Japan. 
Uh, so maybe just to touch on the, the, the first question, a bit of the, the third as well. Um, so I think if your company or your, your business or your platform or your product or whatever it is that you're releasing um, is for, uh, first and foremost, for Japanese, uh, then I think Japan is obviously the place to do it. And I think the companies that I see that, that aren't able to fundraise as well here or don't really succeed as well uh, are people that are trying to do something that uh, the, the first target audience, uh, maybe Japan is a pilot, but it's not really uh, a core demographic. Uh, and I'd say Japanese investors, people here, will be very supportive when you're trying to do something that will actually help them. So I think if you're really integrating into society and into culture and you are taking a part in that, then I think it's it's a great place to do so. But if you're trying to build out a you know a, a global product or uh, you know some chip or something else, then you may as well do it outside of Japan, uh, then you should probably do it outside of Japan, uh, unless you just happen to be Japanese and living here. But even then, I think that you'll find better talent and, and more competition fundraising uh, in an environment that fosters that. Um, and why that all happens then in, in Tokyo? Uh, so I think there are you know some exceptions to the, the norm, but all the VCs are in Tokyo. The, uh, the large, a very large fraction of the, the population is in Tokyo, so we're talking to users or professionals. And so I, I think you can do kind of, again, pilots. I think Fukuoka is doing a great job trying to build out their ecosystem. I know there's other parts of Japan that are really trying to encourage that as well, and I think that would be great. But the, the reality is that the majority of the ecosystem is here in Tokyo, and so that's why we're here in Tokyo. Okay, so maybe we can take one other round of questions. Yes, and gentlemen there. Uh, excuse me. Uh, one of the uh, uh, routes to success in Silicon Valley that's not been discussed at all here, but I wonder how it stacks up in Japan, is the uh, exit by acquisition by one of these uh, big companies. Um, uh, Siri, Siri was a little company spun out of uh, Stanford Research Institute, mm -hmm. and uh, Steve Jobs saw it and. $200 million later, it was a piece of Apple, uh, or YouTube and, and, and uh, Google, and so on and so on, many of But it wasn't mentioned here at all as being a, uh, a, way, a way to do something good and then get out with a lot of money. Let's take a look. I am an MBA student at Globis, and I'm taking entrepreneurial leadership now. And one thing we learned, which is very important to be successful in our business, is to have the right people uh, uh, in our team to uh, to be successful, so have the good people to get in our bus. This is a reference to good to great board. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any tips to uh, help us to find the right people? And maybe we can take one more question. Someone. Okay, so so this the, the answer to the M and A opportunities uh, and also the hiring good talents. Maybe just to being based in Japan, talk to the, the M&A question. So I think traditionally, uh, one of the other ongoing jokes in Japan was that the Series B was an IPO. And so I think people uh, generally, when going to raise more funds or going to do an exit, would do an IPO here. And that was the easiest source of, uh, you know, of, of liquidity or for future capital. Uh, I'd say that's definitely changing. And I think you can see in the trends, uh, KDI buying out you know, Swaracom, uh, you know, Line making very, very large investments or buying out companies. And so, I think that as Japanese tech companies have more and more cash on their balance sheets, uh, as recruiting companies see that their you know business models are, are going to be changing, um, I think there definitely have been more and more M and A, uh, but it's still not at the levels that you see in the U.S. And I think that that you know the the level of, part of it is due to the level of risk taking, part of it is due to people's expectations around the exit um, levels, and usually the M and A traditionally has been on a much smaller scale. But I think the last uh, year or two have actually been really encouraging from an M&A perspective. And I don't have the, the numbers on hand, but uh, I, would, I would bet that it's on a, a very good trend. Um, but I think the easy to access IPO market is another uh, reason that a lot of these companies that may have been up for M&A um, maybe first go public and then merge. Um, congrats to your question, which is a very important one. I think um, it's very difficult, and I don't think there's a shortcut. With currently hiring upwards of 50 people a month and it's tremendously time consuming. We haven't found any kind of smart or algorithmic way to, to, to short track talent. It's just a very you know, long process. Um, so from my experience, it's just a lot of work meeting a lot of people.
<laughs> I don't know if you found any short track. Please tell me. Um, regarding the M&A strategy, I think it's a good strategy, but it's not the only strategy. For if you're passionate about your company, why would you like to sell? Um, just build a company that can grow and can potentially differentiate into something that I, I wouldn't like to buy or sell my company. I want to build a company and expand it. And um, So I think if you're passionate as a founder in, and you really believe in what you're building, uh, M&A could be interesting in terms of strategy. For example, in our case, being integrated into an Apple Watch could be a way to access millions of users, but at the same time, it's not necessarily, we lose control of our, of our babies. Um, regarding the people, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, I, I was exposed to a lot of people in Silicon Valley and it took me years. And uh, eventually my two co-founders, one is Lebanese, the other one is from Singapore, both Canadians and from Mexico. We met in a conference in Cancun. So serendipity. Uh, sometimes it's just being in the right time, the right moment, and be sure that you resonate with the core values of your co-founders because you're gonna marry them. Like, the amount of stress that you go through the first years of, of the company, it's unbelievable. So if you don't resonate with the core values, the team is gonna fail. Okay, so we, we covered a lot of topics from entrepreneurship to ecosystem and different policies and some of the challenges and opportunities that the entrepreneurs are facing. Uh, we have uh, maybe 30 seconds each for the final thoughts that you, you missed to cover or uh, some of the uh, final messages that you want to share. Let's start with uh, Christopher. No final topics, just a big thank you for letting me participate. It's been incredibly interesting today. Thank you. And your beer is amazing, actually. I went to your place uh, two days ago. Very good, very good restaurant. Um, just final words. Um, I really love Japanese culture, and one of the things that I practice is tea ceremony. And uh, there's a, a phrase that I really live that is Ichigo Ichie. Every time it's an opportunity, and you need to take the advantage of that, as if you're only going to live that once. So I think for entrepreneurs, it's a way of living, and you need to take advantage of every day that you have. So. Uh, maybe just touching on the, the conference theme of being a fractured world, uh, I'd say our business, we look at a very, very fractured market uh, that has very little transparency and is, is very inefficient. And I would basically just say what we've seen as trend in, in our space, but also in all consumer sectors, uh, is that the internet, you know, m mobile phones, the, the direction that things are going, I think things are getting less and less fractured. And there's going to be more and more transparency, and it's going to be ever easier to, to connect. So I think it's just incredibly valuable. Uh, beyond that being in a room of people that are very talented and very diverse and so I think continuing to have those open uh, you know th those conversations with people that, that have different beliefs and being in a diverse environment is uh, is, is really priceless so uh, yeah just thank you again for uh, for holding this and, and letting us be part it's been wonderful okay so with that let's take thanks to entrepreneurs for sharing their insights and knowledge and thank you for the audiences for the questions thank you very much